Hello, my name is Jean Grinnell, and I am on the board of directors here at the Douglas Historical Society. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the building and the store as it operated. The building was built in approximately 1833. We found a couple dates earlier and a couple days later. This is the date that shows up most often is 1833. And it was built by Ebenezer Balcom and his son, Elias. The two of them ran the store for several years. And then in 1839, they sold the store to Gardner Chase. So in 1839, Gardner Chase bought the store. He did have experience running other grocery stores. He did live here in Douglas. He dedicated himself to the store. He wanted it to be perfect to the extent that his doctor told him he had to retire. He was literally working himself to death in the store. And not too long after he retired, he did pass away. And uh, the store was then sold to Mr. Jenks, Edward H. Jenks. Um, his family lived upstairs. He ran the store until his death in 1924 at which time his daughters, Emayama and Helen, took over. Mr. Jenks was also a representative in the state legislature. This was the original front of the store. This was the front door. It only came out to about here. Each owner added a little something himself. So, um, the Mr. Chase actually is the one who made the store wider. He also built the barn in the back. Later, he added the back store, as the back area over here was referred to. And then he put a grain room in between the back store and the barn, so that it's connected right through. So you don't have to go outside to get to the barn or to the grain room, it's all connected right through. Um, when Mr. Jenks died, as I said, his daughters ran the store till about 1950. Then it became a thrift store. And in 1970, the girls donated the store to the Historical Society as a living memorial for their father. They had a lot of respect for their father. He, um, now, as I said, this is where they first came in. This was the front door. If you look behind, the counter, if you want to move your camera over there, you'll see a safe that dates back to 1877. Huh? This is the original cash register to the store. And before the cash registers became prevalent, there are actually drawers under the counter that they used as their cash drawers. So if you want to follow me around this way, I'll show you a little bit over here. This was the grocery section. This is where the women would come to get their coffee, their flour, their sugar, whatever they needed for their baking or other home needs. Also, they would barter with customers. You needed some material to make a dress. Bring us in an apple pie. We'll take your apple pie, give you the material. We'll sell the apple pie to somebody else. So they did quite a bit of bartering back in the day. Um, let's see. This 18 foot counter uh, was where they actually went to buy their objects. It's very worn from all the baskets. All these baskets you see hanging around, they would uh, fill them to make home deliveries. So there's constantly baskets sliding all up and down the uh, counter. In the corner over here, on those shelves, you could get like your Band-Aids and your cough syrup and simple uh, medicines like that. If you needed a prescription, just across the churchyard there was a pharmacy, Stillman's Pharmacy. But a lot of people, you know, got pretty much everything they needed here. You can see on the shelves, on the top shelves, you see a lot of tea boxes, um, 
Mr. Jenks would special order teas and cheeses and he would go down to the um, depot in Providence to the uh, docks and pick up his orders. They also, as you can see, had a lot of the common things we use today, baking powder, you know, uh, lard, back in the day, lard was very popular. And uh, this is where they would come. People would bring in their eggs and we'd sell the eggs to somebody else. On the wall over here behind you, you see a lot of the items that would have been used in their homes, the kerosene lamps, the uh, different um, things like to polish furniture and um, all kinds of uh, equipment to keep their homes good. This behind you, Lisa, is a stove, which would have typically heated a building like this or even a home. And they were, this one I think is wood, but most of them would be kerosene. The heyday for the store was from um, 1890-ish to 1920 is when they had their biggest boom. Then more modern things started to come into play. So um, Mr. Jenks, as I told you, everybody added something to the store. He added, and we'll get a better look at it later, the big skylight up on the other side of the store. So they all put their own touch onto it. Now, Everybody remembers when Amazon became big. Amazon delivers, you don't have to go out. They'll <laughs> deliver it right to your house. Well, back in the day, the Jenk store delivered. They had three wagons and a sleigh, in case the winter, they couldn't get the wagons out there. But on Mondays and Wednesdays, they had um, four men who worked in the store, one woman. And the men would go out to their customers, take their orders on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they would deliver them. Um, Monday, I'm sorry, Monday and Thursday, they went out Tuesday and Friday, they delivered. Wednesday, the store would be open till about noon, and then it would be closed as most of the other businesses in town did also. And in this case, they would check the carriages make sure they were all set, make any repairs that needed to be done, go to the uh, train depot or the port and pick up orders that they were waiting to come in. So Wednesday was half work day for customers and then the rest was getting anything else done that had to be completed to keep business flowing. <laughs> they, um, Let's see, uh, I told you about the teas and cheeses. You can see tons of barrels around here that would have their flour and their grains, oats, different stuff like that in them. Um, this string, you can see up on the back here, you see a piece of string, a uh, roll of string, piece hanging down. People would come to the counter, they'd bag up their items, maybe have some coffee ground up for them, a uh, bag of flour, they take the string, tie up their bag, and they would take their bag and go home. This scale still works, still pretty accurate. You, they used this until the state required an electronic scale. So this is original to the store also. And behind you, you can see up on above Mr. Balcom's name, and those are all rolls of um, wallpaper. Over here we have a display of axes, axe heads, axe handles. The Douglas Axe Mill was the first big business in town. They had shops all over the town. You know, one shop might do the grinding on the axe head, one might make the handle, but they were all over town. They went to, in, nine, in 1878, they went over to Europe for uh, fairs and exhibitions. They actually won uh, at the 
World's Fair in Paris, they came in first, mm -hmm. and then went to a couple of other countries where they also won awards. They didn't come in first, but they also won awards. This chest was made special to carry all the axe heads over to Europe. And every design on there is an axe head. <laughs> it's quite a project. This is, I didn't know what it was for a while, it's <laughs> something relatively new to the museum, is a sharpener for your saws. There's a device over here where you would put the saw in and take it back and forth and it would sharpen your everyday saw. Um, as I mentioned before, kerosene heated most of the homes. They cooked with it. They could come here to get their kerosene also. This little device over here goes down, goes down into the cellar where we would keep a supply of kerosene. And the customer would come in with their can, put it on the stand, and then we could pump up what they needed for kerosene. Wow. In there, behind that window, uh, they would get in from the outside. Or, no, they covered that up. But that was a stairway that would go down into the cellar. And obviously not used anymore. <laughs> Over here you see some of the housewares that they would use. The old bowls and the old... Everybody now has a cast iron frying pan, but back then that was what they everybody used. Good for cooking. You see various displays of the types of irons they would use. Um, many a man's shirt, I'm sure, <laughs> had a big black iron mark on the back of it. Um, some of their baking things. This little item here. Let me take a guess what this is. No idea. Grinder. Good guess. Ooh. It's a washing machine. Really? <laughs> this is a model the salesman would take around. You put your clothes in here and then suppose your agitator <laughs> to do your laundry. It was made and invented here in Douglas. And this is a full size version. I'm going to count it here. How long would you have to, do you know? No, I don't. <laughs> but I, I imagine it would have been a bit easier than, you know, the scrub board. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, as I said, it, it didn't really take off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, behind you, we have a display of Bissell sweepers right over here. Mm -hmm. Way back when. We have sent them pictures of our display, and they were, they were like surprised that somebody actually had those all out there. But um, they used to have this material, it was called a grain carpet. It wasn't very heavy, but they could use um, these sweepers to clean it. And also, I, I love this, this one. I, I wouldn't want to be the woman who had to clean her floor with this. This was a vacuum cleaner also. Hmm. But you had to pump this to suck it up what was on your floor. That would take a while to clean your floor. <laughs> but that was one of the earliest vacuum cleaners. I think someone who could afford that could afford the servants, and the servants would have yes. to go walking around. <laughs> You're probably right on that. So again, we had some of the, the laundry soaps that they would use. A lot of them are still around. We bought them. Mean, we still can get ivory soap, swan. A lot of these products are still available. They would get a lot of things here. The um, salesmen would come to town, stay at the local hotels, and they would give them free access to a drum room. So they were called the drummers. They didn't play drums, <laughs> but the drummers were, were salesmen who would come and set up, and the public, not only the businesses, but they could go in and buy. And um, they would give them this b room for free, and they were called drummers. The drum ones would go to the drum room, and they would buy 
maybe something a little cheaper than if they had to come here. But they would make um, stuff available for the general public to go in yeah. and not have to come into the store. Um, I'll show you the opening for the cellar. The salesmen were known as drummers, as I said, but they didn't really play the drums. <laughs> now, you've heard of the National Register of Historical Places. There are over 90,000 places on that register. In Massachusetts, there are 4,300 places on that register. This building is on that register. And it's very unique, because out of those nine, what did I say, 90,000 other places, this is the only one that has only been used for its original purpose, oh, okay. that of a store. So I'll take you around the other side and show you some of our artifacts. We do get lots of donations. We do like them to be period related. <laughs> We're kind of full up with things we've got recently. <laughs> um, so hopefully when our, we take stuff that we can use for the store and we also take items that we can use in our yard sales. Being a nonprofit, we have to make our money wherever we can. And a lot of people have helped us. Oh, great. With that, by just leaving donations. They know they have. They can leave it out by the barn, mm -hmm. and somebody will come down and bring it in. And we've had a lot of people do that, too. Okay. Because we're not always open, mm -hmm. so we don't want them to not come. So we let them know, bring it down. Usually somebody goes by here every day, mm -hmm. and if necessary, they can stop and just bring it into the building. Okay. So this side would take care of their household needs, cooking supplies, different foods, um, fuel to heat and cook in their homes. And then on the other side over here, we have some of the other items as far as your daily life. Everybody needs shoes and clothes and those types of items, and they would provide those things here also. look up on the soffit, you'll see books that line all the way around. Those are customer books. They would keep track of things that they charge. And the customer would also have a, a small little record book that they could keep track of things themselves. So they would, um, right now we just have like toys displayed that would have been relevant in uh, the era of the store. See, we have an old record player here. Um, one of our young men who helped us, Mr. Ben Ashworth, worked on that and actually got it to operate again. Oh, wow. The sound is horrible, <laughs> but it does play a record if you put it, wind it up and put it on there. This green bench is original to the store, and people who came in to buy shoes would sit on this bench to try them on. A lot of these boxes are original, and the shoes are all original to the store. In the far corner is, they would get stationary items, and Mr. Jenks would do his record keeping over here. As you can see, this is the skylight I mentioned that Mr. Jenks added. It really added some light to this end of the building. Gentlemen's section. They could get hats. They could get long johns. They could get shirts, uh, shaving equipment, shoes, uh, anything gentleman related. They could, they would have it here or they could get it for them. And the last section over here would be the women's section. They would have, um, again, hats and hosiery, shoes. Pretty much this whole wall over here is um, dedicated to the women. They have their sewing equipment, yarns, materials, threads. 
see hat boxes that they may take a hat glue. Mm -hmm. Rug making. These were both donated to the store. Both of these uh, treadle sewing machines were donated to the store. This sewing kit is a relatively new acquisition. What a lot of the ladies back in the day would have a little kit like this and have all their patterns and their needles. I was going through it and I actually found an old pattern for uh, mittens that I'm making now. And it was the same pattern. I was like, holy cow. I was really surprised. And, and all of this is um, sewing stuff, crochet stuff, knitting stuff. And that's the extent of the museum. Well, as I said, we try, we do take donations. We prefer period donations, but we do take other donations that can help us raise money for the museum. We are located at 283 Main Street in, in Douglas, Massachusetts. We're directly across the street from the Webster Savings Bank, so it's easy to find. We try to be open every weekend during spring through fall. We have a small crew of people, so that isn't always easy. So if you want to lend a hand, give us a call. We're always looking for extra help, and we would be glad to welcome you into the store. Thank you.